Jessica Chastain is a two-time Oscar-nominated, multiple award-winning actress. That's right. And Tom Hiddleston is a star of stage and screen with a Laurence Olivier Award to his name and a bunch of other nominations, too. Together, they star in the new horror film Crimson Peak as brother and sister duo Thomas and Lucille Sharp. Take a look. She knows who I am and she wants me to leave. Nonsense, my dear. You're not going anywhere. You had a bad dream. You were sleepwalking. No. I'm afraid I shall go mad if I stay. My darling, you're imagining things. Tomorrow, why don't we go out uh, to the post office? I think some fresh air would do you good. No. I have to leave. I have to get away from here. Edith, this is your home now. You have nowhere else to go. Creepy stuff, and I'm so happy to welcome the two of these wonderful folks to HuffPost Live. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, I watched the movie, creepy stuff. <laughs> really, really creepy stuff, and the two of you do an amazing job. Um, we said horror at the top, but a kind of catchphrase that we're thinking about really when it comes to this film is gothic romance. What is the difference between a horror movie and a gothic romance? Well, All right, Cambridge boy. <laughs> uh, um, I'll do my best. Uh, I mean, gothic romance is itself a, a genre, um, as separate from horror. You know, I think horror is something that has evolved um, more recently as something that is explicitly about terrifying you, right. about giving you nightmares, about creating the scariest environment possible. And gothic romance is more... Um, you know, when, when it came around in, in literature, it, it's, it's, it was the first time that anyone had explained the supernatural in terms of unprocessed emotional trauma. The idea that, that ghosts were um, emotions locked in time, that they were warnings about the past or the future. Um, and it's always bound up with um, these two forces of love and death. And usually there is a young, innocent heroine who is uh, drawn to a tall, dark stranger with a crumbling mansion and, and, um, and impelled into a very dangerous situation by her sexuality. And, and at the time, it was a very rebellious genre. People didn't, you know, people didn't talk about sex and death in the same context. Um, and so Crimson, that's where Crimson Peak um, sits. It, it is squarely a love story with ghosts in it. Jessica, just hearing him speak, right, mm -hmm. is so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, right? Um, you yeah. mentioned the Thanks innocent too. heroine, right? Yeah. But Jessica, you didn't want to play the innocent heroine this time around. Mm. Why is that? Over to you. You wanted to play oh. the villain. You know, um, I think I surprised Guillermo when he sent me the script because, I mean, what actress doesn't go for the lead, right? <laughs> you think, okay, yeah. great, great part. But I never played a character like Lucille. Um, I am an actress because I want to learn more about people and we do that by walking around in someone else's shoes for right. a while and mm. Lucille to me is the furthest I could imagine um, of a person uh, juxtaposed against myself, my personality, my desires and wants yep. and I wanted to ex explore that, I wanted to explore this just immeasurable loneliness and inability to give and to receive love but wanting it desperately mm -hmm. um, so for me it was like a science project <laughs> you know it's funny the two of your characters were complicated characters yeah. in the sense that we could say that they're you know bad guys right um mm. but you feel exactly <laughs> there, there you go and insert the er uh, but you feel that there's so much behind it um, yeah. Expand on that a little bit for me. Yeah, I would say I would never say anyone was a bad guy. I know that's a hard thing to explain. It's our job as actors. We defend every any character that we're playing. Mm. Even if you're playing Hitler, you have to defend the choices that your character is making. You have to understand why and say, well, what what has happened in their life? What has happened? The history, the, the people around them that has enabled this kind of behavior. And I feel myself just maybe it's my personal philosophy, I feel that we're all responsible for the actions of, of everyone. It's not just one person individually. And so for me, that's why I wouldn't say necessarily they were bad guys. For me, uh, the main villain of the movie are the parents of the Sharps, because uh, they've really programmed these siblings to deal with the outside world and to deal with love in a certain way. 
And we Tom, I, I want you to, to talk about that too, because with your character, even in the same scene, I could love him or I could hate him within the same couple of minutes. Yeah. So talk about taking on I a role. I feel that every day. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> talk about taking on a role where you have to, you really have to balance those two things at the same time. Yeah, it's, um, you know, we, the, when Jessica and I and Guillermo del Toro met up for the first time, yeah. um, about two weeks before we started shooting the film, uh, we, um, there's a, a novelist called Josephine Hart, and she said something which became a kind of, um, a kind of cornerstone quotation for the two of us, which is, damaged people are dangerous because they know how to survive. Mm -hmm. And that's Thomas and Lucille, mm -hmm. you know, that actually they, they are people who have, who are responsible for some, um, for some terrible and some tragic things, but it's all come from, it's all come from a place of, of psychological damage. And there is a degree of psychological ex excavation that we're required to do. Um, and I found it, I found Thomas a, a sort of compelling prospect because on, on the one hand, he is the romantic hero, or at that time he presents himself. He's um, uh, refined and sophisticated and elegant and mysterious, and everybody's drawn to him. He has a kind of magnetic charisma. But behind that, there is a, a darker secret um, imbued with guilt and shame and vulnerability. And actually, the film, for me, is that it's most interesting when Thomas is beginning to understand um, his own responsibility for the things he's done and separate himself from from the choices that he and Lucille have made together. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, because I have to ask, because also I thought, I mean, I went around and I asked a couple of people. Yeah. Here and I didn't think that people still believed in ghosts, especially after a certain age. However, they do, I have come to learn today. Of course. Yeah. What is it that scares the two of you? And I've heard, Jessica, you say politicians. Well, actually, that I stole Guillermo's answer. <laughs> that was Guillermo's answer. I was like, that's a good one. Politicians. I mean, I, I don't like snakes or spiders. Uh-huh. I'm okay with spiders. I haven't seen too many snakes. Snakes? If you woke yeah. up and there was not, not the human kind of snake, <laughs> But there was a snake on your pillow, or a spider on your pillow. You would not go. Yeah, I would. I think I would be like. I would, but I would be okay. I, I think. But I it's scary, like, right? Yeah, it is. It's scary. I, I see what I find scary. I was thinking about this the other day. I find <laughs> um, hysteria terrifying. Mm -hmm. I find the idea of like mm. the masses losing control of their logic and reason, and doing and acting in a sort of yeah. ra in rash panic. As a, as, a, as a crowd, I find like that. I find that. I find the prospect of that terrifying. The second half of the film really becomes terrifying. I mean, there's a beautiful story behind it, and there's such a story behind it, but it does get pretty graphic, you know, toward the end. Tell me about that. I mean, the scenes. I, I don't even want to mention these things, obviously, because I've seen the film already. But but talk about that. There no, is more in this film. Spoilers in this movie, but I think. Well, I can't even say that. I, I mean, no. yeah, it's it was it's a difficult section to shoot. The last twenty minutes of the film, I think, is is high gear. High gear. And uh, yeah. it was really tough. There was, and you see it in the trailer. You see things like I'm reaching through these gates, and you know, with gear, a couple, you have to do it very fast and a lot of running. And I remember at one point, my um, hand just started to swell up with blood because oh. I had broken blood vessels by constantly putting my hands through the bars. I mean, there's this kind of energy that you have to sustain, um, which is an extreme energy for <laughs> yeah. for days on yeah. end. So you, you feel exhausted. It, it, it's, it, there's something about the last half hour of the film where every character is in, is in a genuinely life or death scenario. Yeah. Right. Um, and adrenaline and cortisol is, is coursing through their veins. And, um, and there, is, there is a sort of breathlessness and terror to it um, that feels physically violent. I mean, those mm. are the, you're having to put your body into those circumstances. And so that was, um, yeah, it's at fever pitch, right. for sure. And Jessica and Tom, uh, as we always do, we love to bring in our members from the HuffPost Live community to ask you Great. questions. Fantastic. And Maria from Spain left this question for both of you. Hi, everyone. I'm off to see the movie right now, and I'm completely obsessed with Guillermo del Toro's incredible design for the house. So, little Thomas Sharp and I were wondering if you had any special corner or favorite room around the set. <laughs> little mm. Thomas Sharp. <laughs> um, my, around the set, uh, 
yes, there were lots of different parts of the set. I loved, um, I loved uh, Thomas's workshop. Um, there was something very beautiful. Guillermo had, had um, a part of Thomas is his creativity, mm -hmm. that actually um, he's an engineer and he's a dreamer. And he's someone who invents things. He's very good with his hands. And, and he, has a, he, he truly is gifted. And, um, and always has been, and perhaps if he'd had a different life, he could have become one of the great industrialists. And I think the workshop is where he spends all his time. And the production design oh. in that space was just breathtaking. It was, it was lit beautifully by the sun that's in the attic of the house, and, and there were all these little... Um, that's where he keeps his, his craftsmanship, his craftsman's tools, and he makes little trinkets for Lucille when they're children, and... and um, and he makes things, and that's, that's where his, his love is, that's where his heart is in that part of the house. What kind of a difference does it make as an actor to work on a set like that? I would imagine there's a lot of green screen, and you just don't have sets that are that fully realized. So does it make a difference in the performance? Are you able to lose yourself a little bit better or more often working in a house like that? Yeah. This is the most um, beautiful set grand set I've ever worked on. However, I've been really lucky. I tend to work with filmmakers who don't use green screen. Christopher Nolan, I don't think we had any green screen in that film. Even the last section in the Tesseract was all lights and mirrors and glass reflecting it. Mm. Um, so for me, it's everything. A practical set. I, Lucille spends a lot of time in the kitchen and we had running water and I was able to actually really cook eggs on that stove and we wow. had working fireplaces, an elevator that went up and down three flights. It was in the largest soundstage in North America. Yeah. And usually, people don't do this anymore. This is a throwback to how uh, Hollywood films used to be made. It was Which amazing. must have been such a pleasure. Yeah, I mean, it was like, it, it, as Jessica says, we shot it in Toronto. Um, there's a big studio there uh, by the lake. And, and I guess there's maybe six sound stages. And, and on the largest sound stage, they built the interior of the house. And I remember the first time I was summoned to see it. I was in the middle of a costume fitting. I was wearing a tailcoat. And Guillermo rushed in and said, it's ready, you have to come. And I ran across the lot and opened the door like you would open the door to any other soundstage, you know. It's like going to work. But it was like walking through some kind of magic mm -hmm. portal into another world. It was like a fantasy. Wow. Um, it was really, really remarkable. Please tell me it's still standing. No. It's not. That's oh. the magic of movies. That is no, so but it's the sadness, though, too. I was heartbroken. I said to Guillermo, can't they just move it somewhere else? You know, it was a work of art. A yeah, work of no, art. I, I, I think it should be recreated and put in some kind of, you know, universal studio. <laughs> right, like a theme park, I know. <laughs> As I, watching the movie, I'm like, I was thinking, one, it's so believable, so I actually thought it might have been a real home. Yeah. Um, but if not, I was hoping it was still standing so that we could actually tour it uh, one day. Jessica, I want to ask you this question. I don't know if you're going to love it or if you're going to oh, hate geez, it. Oh, jeez, lay um, on me. But putting your name into Google, I cannot tell you how many times <laughs> an article comes up that okay. says... Jessica Chastain, next Meryl Streep. Oh, I thought you were going to say something really bad, actually. No. Oh, my gosh, of course not. <laughs> so what is your reaction to that? I, I don't know. Maybe if you're annoyed by it or if you like it, kind of give me your response oh, are you to actually those kinds of article? statements. What yeah, there it? you go. Here's one. Here's one. Oh, geez. Wow. That's... Listen, I thought you were going to say something bad. This is a nice thing. <laughs> of course. I mean, she's yeah. the one of the greatest American actresses ever. It's a wonderful yeah. thing to be... Um, even mentioned in the same sentence as her, it's not accurate. <laughs> I can be, I can just tell you all, it's it's not accurate. Um, there's only one Meryl Streep. There was only one Betty Davis, um, and to, there's only one Jessica Chastain. No, there's only one Jessica Chastain. No, Chastain. but to try to think of your career as saying, well, I want to, I want to aspire to be something else. It's just impossible to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at those movies she made in, in the 70s, they're some of my favorite American films ever and um, we don't make movies like that anymore we don't and we don't ha I, I feel bad saying this we don't have an actress like her really except for her okay until you become the next Meryl Streep all right <laughs> uh, moving on though I, wa I want to talk about this because you are such a supporter of women in Hollywood yeah and I you've am. spoken up about the so wage gap guy. and so is Tom thank you ma'am mm -hmm. who can be doing perhaps more to help bridge well, the wage gap together. I have to tell you, I was really happy to see... What, were you wearing a He For She t-shirt or something? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for me, listen, it's, it's wonderful that people are starting to talk about mm -hmm. the, the wage gap and really that it's an issue. Uh, women can talk about it, but it actually moves me a lot 
to hear men talk about it as well. Um, I think the uh, film industry is an incredible group of people, and we've realized that there's a huge problem and that we need more diversity. We're not telling the stories of many, we're telling the stories of few. Um, there's a problem with the storytelling, the protagonists, and, and how, they, the, um, how they gear um, in American cinema. And there's also a huge problem in the wage gap. It's all in front of the camera and behind the camera, across the board. And so the more that we all discuss it as a community, that's what I think um, is going to help it. And so people like Tom or you and me and, and us all saying, this is not how we want to be working, and we need to tell the stories of all. I truly think it's anathema to reason and reasonable thought. It should have been done a mm -mm. long time ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I, um, I don't know the nuts and bolts of some of the more, more publicized um, inequalities in, in the pay gap. Um, obviously, I don't, I don't know how no, those negotiations went down. But it's, it, to me, it's, it's completely unreasonable. Yeah. Um, and I completely agree with what Jessica just said. But also to, and I've actually never said this, I think, so uh, here we go. Um, there's also misinformation out there. Like someone wrote an article once that said that I made a certain amount of money for The Martian. Mm -hmm. I made less than a quarter of that in reality. Wow. And so people are already saying, well, yeah, she's making a lot less than her male co-stars because she's making this. I made less than a quarter of that in reality. So there is a huge wage gap in the industry. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, it needs to be fixed. Yeah. And, and soon. All right. Um, the other thing I would say, actually, and, I, and in his absence, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll give him a shout out because he needs it, is um, Guillermo del Toro with Crimson Peak has done something very revolutionary. Yes. Um, and he has made a film where the heroine, played by Mia Vashikovska, saves herself. Right. She is not saved by the hero. Um, uh, she, she's in command of her own destiny. And it's an incredibly powerful message to young women that you don't need a man to, to save you that, you, that your life is your own. And you can be a sexual, yeah. woman, a realized yeah. woman and not have to pay for it. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, in this genre, you can yeah. actually be a full-blooded yeah. woman. And, and, it, and the thing about, about Crimson that. is that, the, you know, that it really is a, when you boil it down, it's a battle. It's, it's, um, it's about two women. That's what the Crimson Peak is about. Mm. It's right. about. It's about Edith and Lucille. And actually a free kind of love and a very possessive kind of love. Right. Yeah. I thought about that when I watched the movie, and I really appreciated it. Um, but Jessica, I also want to know, since there aren't that many films that perhaps end in that way, mm -hmm. um, what <laughs> kind of a message do you think that sends a young girl who's mm -hmm. going to a movie and always seeing herself depicted as someone supporting a man, or that the film is not about her, it's always about a man, and mm. she's only there to compliment him. What do you think that does to a girl, to her subconscious, to her psyche? Do you know, I received a text today from a, my, my friend and fellow actor, Axel Henny, who's a Norwegian actor. We did The Martian together, and he had just seen the movie, and he went with his 10-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. And I actually got kind of emotional when reading the text today, because it said, you know, my daughter likes to skate, and she likes to climb trees, and, you know, she's my best friend. And she has a hard time in this world of storytelling when there aren't women represented that way. Mm -hmm. And he said, like, you know, 40 minutes into the film, she just turned to me and said, wow, she's so tough. Yeah, and he, nice. I, and it was just, I mean, that's what I want in these movies. I have to be careful when I'm choosing roles. I want to inspire people. I want little girls to watch The Martian and say, I want to be the commander of Mission to Mars. I want to be in this movie <laughs> and say that actually it's okay. You can, you know, have these desires to be a writer and to fall in love and do all this, and you can actually save yourself. Um, so, yeah, for me, the, the more uh, independent and um, free a woman is, I think those are the, the most inspiring stories for these little girls. I, Making choices like that makes yeah. such a difference. And I want to get to another fan of yours, Jessica, who has a question. Rachel wanted to ask you this. Hi, Jessica. I'm Rachel from SpicyPop.com, and here is my question for you. Sandra Bullock recently played a character that was originally written for a male. If you could play any male character in film history, who would it be and why? Mm. Ooh, hi, Rachel. Um, uh, let's see. In film history, I would play Indiana Jones. 
That's a good one. Yeah. See, that's a very fun role to play. A very yeah. fun role to play, and you get to like do fun stunts and run around the jungle. And I would means because he always had like good looking ladies by himself, so I have good looking men <laughs> <laughs> all around me. It would be fun. And very tough. <laughs> now I want to get to Tom your fandom because sure. there is a fandom emerging Ooh. right now, which is emerging. It's talk about there. tough. I mean, they don't they don't mess with anybody. <laughs> um, so they're called the Hiddlestoners. Are you aware of this? Y yes, I am. Th this is a name that they've given themselves, um, and uh, I don't know, it's very creative. It involves <laughs> my last name. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, by, you know um, I do think there's an interesting conversation to be had around actors and fans. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, I, t I just think of them as an audience. I think of them yeah. as a... It's a, oh, look, what's this? This is a... Well, yeah, I wanted to get to it, uh -oh. but here we go, here we go. So, Jessica, if you haven't, uh, you'll get a laugh out of this. So, the Hiddle Stoners, by definition on Urban Dictionary, are a devotee of the cult of Hiddles. Wow, you're someone who worships the glory that is <gasps> Tom Hiddleston. Ooh, that's slightly uncomfortable. <laughs> and, he is glorious. Way, <laughs> I will say, ladies, he's glorious. Used in a sentence. But... <laughs> I will give you an example. <laughs> That girl dumped me after she saw Thor. Responds. Didn't take it person. Don't take it personally, mate. She became a Hiddlestoner. No one can compete with Tom Hiddleston. Wow. wow. How do you feel about that? Is yeah. that uh, is that a big uh, thing to follow? <laughs> That's big boots. To fill. Big boots. <laughs> um, oh goodness. I don't what do you know. credit this with? I mean, I, I made a comment on it. Off the, you know, off the top, when you speak, all of a sudden you're just drawn. You know, you're just drawn in. So. <laughs> How do you Making how do you credit this, this fandom? <laughs> uh, how do I what? How do you credit this fandom? How do I credit this fandom? Um, I honestly don't. I don't know. Um, to, to my mind, actually, that you know, that there are. Um, that they're, that they're, they, I've been told of some things they've done which are actually extraordinary. I, I'm a big supporter of UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. And um, for my birthday last year, I received a check in the post for around £50,000, which people had raised in my name to give to UNICEF. Wow. And um, I was touched by that. I thought that was very... Um, it's beautiful. You know, that was a just... It's a great way of, uh, I guess, of supporting what I support. And... Um, I honestly try not to think about it too much. And, you know, <laughs> my favorite thing is we were at Comic Con uh -huh. and so many people dressed as Loki. Like, yeah. was it like the what are they called? The ladies of Loki or the? Um, yeah, Lady Loki. Lady yeah. Loki's yeah. were there and. By the way, Loki's a fascinating character. He's um, he's been in the history of the comics. He's been someone who is who's been both a man and a woman. Um, are you so. trying to change the subject off of the cult of Middleton? Yeah, I think I feel, I feel uncomfortable about, <laughs> don't, about don't being... Don't worry about uh, it, because we actually just ran out of time. But okay. Okay. Jessica, <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, how much fun. It was really, really great to meet you guys. Really nice to meet you. And Crimson Peak hits theaters today, so check it out. More information on the film is in our resource well below, so check out those links. And like what you just heard, we'll listen to it anywhere. HuffPost Live interviews and conversations are now available on iTunes and SoundCloud. And stay with us. More conversations are coming up.